Downs. We're watching my personal learning at the Moodlemoot Canada York University, February 23, 2018. And I'm just going to minimize this and we'll get the introduction started and off we go. We're rocking and we're rolling. Okay, so I'll leave you muted until he's done the intro and then I'll turn you Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm Chris Russell. I'm an uh, interim CIO of York University and delighted to be uh, on the steering committee for this uh, conference. And I hope everybody uh, who has uh, been attending this all, uh, all along this week is, is having a great conference. Uh, for those of you who are uh, new today, uh, welcome, and including um, the big blue button online participants. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce uh, for our, our uh, panel today, uh, Stephen Downs. Uh, Stephen is a Canadian philosopher and commentator in the fields of online learning and new media. Um, he's explored and promoted the educational use of computer and online technologies since 1995. Uh, he gave the 2004 uh, Berntine Oration and was a presenter of the February 2007 online connectivity Connectivism Conference. In 2008, Downs and George Siemens designed and taught an online open course reported as a landmark in the small but growing push towards open learning or open teaching. Widely considered to be the first connectivist massive online open online course. Uh, born in Montreal, Quebec, Downs lived and worked across Canada before joining the National Research Council of Canada as a senior researcher in November 2001. Currently based in Moncton, New Brunswick, Downs is a research at NRC's Institute for Information Technology's e-learning research group. Downs was the winner of the EduBlog Award for the best individual blog in 2005 for his blog, Old Daily. Downs is editor at large of the International Journal of Construction Technology and Distance Learning. So, uh, and uh, Stephen is here to talk to us about uh, why personal learning, and uh, there will be a reactor. Uh, um, uh, panel after this, and I'll, I'll introduce them at that time. Thank you, Stephen. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, thanks for the introduction. I'm actually now based in Ottawa, uh, actually in a little town called Castleman, halfway between Ottawa and Montreal, so we have to update that Wikipedia page. Um, so I only have half an hour, uh, they decided they needed a reaction to me, uh, which is kind of interesting. We'll have to pull back that audio a wee bit for getting some echo up here. Um, so I only have half an hour, I'm going to zip through a bunch of stuff, uh, but it should be a lot of fun, and uh, let's get at her. So first of all, uh, the uh, slides, etc. Are available on the presentation page. That's the URL of the presentation page. So you don't need to take notes or anything like that. If you don't like my slides, it's also on SlideShare. There's a link right on that page to go to that. Um, okay. So let's begin with two perspectives. Two perspectives on the world, two perspectives on life, two perspectives on learning. And on one hand, we have the group, the mass, the collective. On the other hand, we have the individual. And that's the way it's always played, right? The, the, the collective versus the individual. The state versus the individual. And then as we got different nation states and companies and things, we still have the collective versus the individual. But in between those two states, there is the network. It's not centralized, but it's not all atomistic, right? It's not Karl Marx and 
Lenin and Stalin, and it's not Anne Rand and 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 Ross Paul and those people. Uh, it's somewhere in the middle. It's based on connection. It's based on network. And so I focus on that. I dismiss the atomist view pretty much out of hand because I do. Uh, the real distinctions here that we're looking at is what I've termed over the years groups versus networks. Terrible names. I know. I'm sorry. We could call them the collective versus the connective. That probably would have been a smarter choice, but I did this a number of years ago when I was young and foolish. So groups versus networks it is, or collectives and communities, or whatever you want to call it. The big difference here is one way versus many ways. And I'm going to draw this out a little bit. First of all, groups love unity. Groups love everybody working together on one shared objective, vision statement, common purpose, shared meaning, all of that. But in a network, there's diversity. There are mixtures of things. It's the melting pot versus the solid bowl of the, of the, of the network. Each individual doing their own thing. Each individual with a unique perspective, unique objectives, unique purposes. In groups, there's coordination. Groups need leaders. They need leadership. How much you, you're reading about leadership all the time, even in educational journals. That's because you need somebody to be calling the tune, playing the trumpet, piping the, you know what I mean, right? There's group values, which tend to be whatever the leaders value. In networks, there's autonomy. There's cooperation. There's exchange. There's mutual value when we get together, but we're not working for the same thing. You're raising your kids, I'm raising my cats. We're doing different things. Oops. Oh, they went together. Okay. Um, groups are closed. There's, you're in the group, you're out of the group. There's membership, there's in camera. Groups have standards, groups have jargons, groups have walls. Networks are open. They are based on connection. You can connect or not connect, whatever you want. Network memberships are fluid. Membership in a network isn't either you're in or you're out. You can be sort of in, sort of out, kind of in, a hanger on, a lurker. It doesn't matter. Networks are based on bridges as opposed to the walls on which groups are based. Groups are distributive. What that means is they're based on the broadcast model. This is a group dynamic. I'm speaking, I'm broadcasting, you're all listening to the content, right? But I have a network perspective, so I know that the important thing here isn't me speaking and you listening. The important thing here is you're all having experience, you'll all get your own perspective, and eventually you'll talk about it after the fact. Some of you right even in front of me. So... Groups typify typical school learning. They typify typical learning, management system learning. Sorry, Moodle. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? Everybody takes a class. Everybody studies the same content. You follow the same instructor. You're in a group. There's a cohort. You have to sign up, etc. Right? My approach is and always has been the network approach which is based on a much looser idea. Uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, this is what we based the massive open online course on, the connectivism MOOC. It was created as a network, not a group. All right. Having introduced it that way, two approaches. The group way is the content way. The network way is the practice way. The group way, the content way, starts with content and then you practice. The network way starts with practice, which might produce content. Maybe, maybe not. It's always an open question. You get that. You see that, right? Think about the different perspectives entailed here. The group way defines an ideal state, the objective, 
a perfect test score, the thing, the knowledge that you're trying to acquire, Pythagorean perfection. The network approach, on the other hand, defines a desired state. It's usually something I'm trying to do, a project I'm trying to accomplish, a job I'm trying to get, whatever. But the idea is, I'm trying to do something. And maybe my effort to do something, you know, forge my own sword, hey, you watch those shows, right? Will produce some content, maybe it won't. In the group way, you do content that produces some kind of practice, a test, an essay, an assignment, and then you are tested. The person who's supposed to be supporting you tests you, evaluates you, and finds you wanting, because they always find you wanting, right? Uh, on the other hand, if you're practicing, you're producing some result, the person there who's to help you is helping you, actually helping you try and accomplish your objective or your goal. You see the iterative loop now is different for each of them. In the group method, you learn some content, you do the test, you are found wanting, you are corrected, there is a knowledge gap, and you go back and do the loop again. So the paradigm is the paradigm case of what they call these days personalized learning, right? Uh, I can make this a little more complex. I can add some branching trees and more iterative loops and things like that. But that is basically personalized learning. Look at the other way, right? Each time I try, I produce a result, I iterate and I try again. I produce a result, I iterate and I try again. And the person who's alongside, they're helping me, they're coaching me, they're mentoring me, whatever. So far so good? Makes sense, right? Pretty reasonable. And who wouldn't want to do it the network way? <coughs> Be insane to do it the other way. Okay, maybe not insane, but... <laughs> All right. The model of the group is the model of the library. It's the model of the static text. It is the model of content that is created, shaped, flaked, formed, and presented as perfection itself. The model of the network is the model of the environment, the place, the arena, the workshop, where you're practicing, the dojo. I've never been to a dojo, so I'm just assuming. It's pretty obvious. <laughs> Personalized learning is learning, almost with the slogan, we do it for you. Learning is Easy, it's fun, it's fast, it's efficient, it's fake. <laughs> Learning the network way is personal. See the difference? You do it for yourself. You create your own learning. Personal learning versus personalized learning. Chocolate, chocolatized. There's a difference there. Now, think about the difference between getting a custom car and a customized car. Right? They're just not the same. Yeah, customized is better than off the rack, but you know, if you're buying a car, let's get custom. A custom suit or a customized. I mean, you get the idea, right? Okay. So we've set it up. They always say do the demo before the theory, but I needed to do the theory first. Now I'm going to zip through a demo. I'd love to linger on this, but I can't. This is a personal learning environment. It's real software. It exists. I use it every day. Uh, and you'll soon be able to use it too. You can use an early version now. It's on GitHub, but the version that's on GitHub is crappy. <laughs> I'm not a professional programmer, right? I'm using software to write, to express my ideas. So let's zip through Grasshopper and take a look at what I think personal learning looks like. So there's Grasshopper. It's my personal learning environment. No branding, no logos, except my own personal logo. And, and that's it. So 
I, I begin with what I want to do, or I can begin. I can look for a job, I can look for a contract, I can look for a project. If I'm in drama, I look for a role. If I'm a carpenter, I look for something to build. You know, you get the idea. Um, this is a bit of a mock-up, right? I, Monster's not physically connected this, to this at the moment. But um, federal government, we have a thing called micro-missions. A micro-mission is a small, short-term assignment in another government department. How does that work? You're in your government department doing whatever, and you find you're only using like 60% of your time to work. What do you do? 40% of your time twiddling your thumbs? No. You find a micro-mission. You go work Fridays in some other department in a different building, meet different people, etc. How do you find these? Like this. Okay, so I can look for stuff. Um, I can find resources related to the stuff that I'm looking for. If I'm looking for a job, I need some training, I look for related resources, open educational resources, whatever. I can find related courses. If I want to do a micro mission in accounting with Treasury Branch, but I need Accounting 101, I can find Accounting 101 in my personal learning environment. Where did it come from? Who cares? I can register for the course, and I don't have the slide here, but take the course right inside my personal learning environment. Why am I leaving my environment and going to some other environment in order to learn my course? This is what I want to do with Moodle, right? I want to grab the content from Moodle, bring it to my place, put it here, where I can use it in my environment, apply it to my... Uh, jobs that I'm looking for, contracts that I'm doing, and use the resources I've already found in the courses that I'm taking. This is the workflow. Now, look at, on the left-hand side, all the different sources of information I can be gathering from. Email, RSS, SharePoint, although who would want to? Uh, Facebook, if they'll let me, Twitter, Monster, Government, Repositories. I should have put Moodle in there, I'm sorry. Uh, etc. Grasshopper itself parses it, scrapes it, analyzes it, it looks at something, it pulls out the content, it pulls out the topics, it pulls out the authors, pulls out the publishers, references to companies, whatever. It, it analyzes the data as it comes in, no matter where it comes from. Puts it in a big database. Whose database? My database. And then I use that database to do stuff, whatever I want. Create articles, publish photographs, videos, whatever I want, we'll see some of this. So, how does this work? We aggregate resources from feeds. So here's a screen where I'm aggregating from something called Culture of Yes. Recent posts are, are things that I've thought useful. Recent links are the most recent stuff that's been aggregated. I manage my feeds, I classify my feeds, I do that ahead of time so you know I don't have to classify each post as it comes in because that's tedious. I manage my harvester, turn it on, turn it off, make it run automatically, make it run every hour, etc. And then I read my harvested resources. I can organize these, you know, what came in today, I can organize these by topic, I can search according to source, topic, whatever. And these things that come in, they're in my database, they're available. Now I'm harvesting a lot of stuff. Grasshopper will eventually delete the old stale stuff that I've never used. So I don't need to worry about cleaning things up. I don't need to worry about having a billion resources. Although I would if I could. I can read these resources while I'm in my course. So I'm in my course. I'm trying to do something, maybe write an essay in my course. My resources are right there. Can't do it in slides, but drag and drop into the essay that I'm writing. Automatic referencing, it's all there together. Why wouldn't I do that? I save my resources as a post or a reference for later use. And so I can write my own little commentary about the resource so I can remember why this resource was important to me. I share my post because I like to work openly. So when I create a post, I share it to Twitter. If you looked up at OLDaily, 
in Twitter, you'll see each one of my posts as I create it pop up in Twitter. Like I say, it's real software, it works really, and I use it every day. I can also share it on the web, Facebook, although I've turned that off because Facebook, um, RSS, JSON, and there's a bunch of other places that I'm still working on. Um, I can listen to related audio feeds because Grasshopper gathers feeds from audio sites. If it sees an MP3 file referenced or embedded in it, it pulls that out, downloads the MP3 file, stores it, creates a playlist, turns it into a radio station that I can listen to in the background. And you can listen to too. It's Ed Radio. Look it up. Uh, I work with various data types. Now, I don't have time to go deeply into this. I define the data types. There's a whole mechanism there. I don't work on predefined data models. Aside, I hate predefined data models. I abhor them. This is why I never get along with programmers who love predefined data models. Um, so I've got companies, concepts, courses, events, and of course calendars and stuff. Feeds, fields, you know, different properties of things, because that's important to me. Um, I've got uh, forms, I've got graphs, institutions, journals, links, media, publications, presentations, of which this is one, etc. If I did different things, I'd have different data. But I use the same system because it doesn't care what data I'm using. Just techie aside, no, it's not uh, Mongo or it's not um, a graph database. I've done this using MySQL because I'm stupid. Uh, I can create pages by combining data. These are a bunch of pages on the left-hand side. Here's an example of a page, and I've sort of expanded it there. And it's a bit, you know, keywordy. Uh, I'd like to make that more visual, but this works for now. So my page here combines announcements, presentations, posts, articles, etc. I can preview my page. Some of you have seen my page. This is OL Daily. I produce using this system every day. I create newsletters from this page. So here I can turn on my newsletter thing, send auto send the email, uh, allow people to subscribe to it, auto subscribe them if they log in, etc. I manage my resource database. This is the thing I was talking about. All kinds of stuff down there that I can't get into. Um, I can also create my own personal learning record as I use this. Personal profile publishing, personal portfolio. Here's my portfolio. Publications, presentations, newsletters. Haven't done it yet, but badges would go right there. Um, haven't done it yet, but projects would go right there, and whatever else. If I'm a carpenter, buildings, right? Uh, if I'm an architect, big buildings. Uh, I can create my portfolio, and of course, my portfolio is shareable, www.downs.ca slash page, because it's a page, slash portfolio with a capital P. I can manage my social media accounts. Oh, oh, right, I can't do that. <laughs> uh, oops. I can manage my social media accounts. I've hidden my uh, key in secret, etc. So, yeah, you, can, you have to create your key in secret on these various social media things. But now uh, I can manage Twitter, I can manage Facebook, although I've turned it off, and my other social media accounts, right? LinkedIn, Google, whatever. Um, this is a standard thing. I can just plug these in. Manage my newsletters. When should it send? Who can subscribe? How they subscribe, etc. There's a whole bunch of things where I can look up the people subscribing and delete them. Um, I can create and attend live meetings using Big Blue Button. I keep all of my configuration stuff in there. So when I want to create a meeting and go to it, I just press on the button and I join my meeting. That's it. And it works. I tested it a couple months ago. This has uh, been around for a long time. Um, and uh, we used it back when we were offering MOOCs in the mid-2000s. I can chat with my social media friends. Now, that's Mastodon. It's just in an iframe for now because 
you know, takes time. But what I want to do is write the API between Grasshopper and Mastodon so it actually shows up in the Grasshopper interface. And then I can write the interface to Twitter so my chat with other people from Mastodon and Twitter show up in my chat interface so I'm not locked into some stupid social media thing. And that's a very quick look at the personal learning environment. Just a note, the personal learning environment, as I mentioned, has a graph in the background, stupidly written in MySQL. Um, so here's the model, right? Stuff comes in, stuff goes out. Um, it gets analyzed, mashed, connected. In my system, there's this great big graph of all the stuff that I've been reading, all the people I've been reading, all the pages I've visited, sites I've visited, topics that they've talked about, etc., and related to all the stuff that I've done. I've got my own personal library of PDFs I've downloaded, ebooks, although I'm not really big on ebooks. I don't have any movies in it because that would be illegal. Um, <laughs> but videos, certainly videos. Uh, learning activities. If we go back to this, you see these rows across the top, right? Those are called scaffolds. And the idea of a scaffold is for any data type, you can create any view or interpretation of that data and functions, generally in JavaScript, working with that data so that your data can be used in different ways. So I could have a scaffold write a letter to grandma. I could have a scaffold look at financial trends and analyze, right? And it would have the data and I could manipulate it and then see graphs. I could have a scaffold which is connect to code pen and then I could take my code, drag it into code pen, work in code pen. Different ways of working with different data. Scaffolds are learning resources. They're open educational resources. They don't exist yet, but if I had a personal learning environment, they would. Grasshopper creates my personal learning record. My personal learning record is based on the graph. It's basically just different views of my graph. It contains all of my learning records, certificates, badges, credentials, activity records, test results, assignments, whatever. These things themselves may be located in different places. Activity records in a learning record store, videos in YouTube, photos in Flickr, articles in Blogger. But my graph has the reference to them all, links them all, and I can present that as a portfolio or use that in analytics anytime I want. Oh yeah, speaking of analytics, my analytics are about me. They're not about the platform that I'm working with. If you use ordinary analytics, ordinary learning analytics, I've highlighted edX because this is what they do, right? They have a big data with a million users. But the only data edX has is edX data. That's pretty useless. I want data that includes my Facebook, Twitter, edX, Coursera, Moodle, YouTube, Blackboard, email, and whatever. That is analytics. That's deep analytics. It's about me, it's mine, and it's for me. So, let's take it home. Why personal learning? I make my own learning decisions. My learning choices are directly related to my projects, my career choices, my opportunities, my needs, my interests, whatever. I decide what I want to learn. Right off the bat, you've solved the motivation problem. I select my own resources. As George liked to say in our MOOCs, right? The first skill you need to learn in any discipline is what resources are useful and what resources are not. These days, we have this big problem with fake news. And education has always had the problem of, of fake learning resources. And above all that, we have to contend with goop. Uh, you know, I choose my resources, and I learn how to choose my resources through the practice and the activity of choosing these resources. And these resources suit my previous experience, my preferences in learning, I hesitate to say learning style, but you know, whatever, um, my trust in the source, and my lack of trust in the source, and of course, my needs. I design my own learning environment. 
You know, typically you'll spend days, years on user experience design trying to find the one design for an application that works for everyone. I look at that and I say, that is craziness. Why would you do that? All right. Uh, so I've created an environment where you can create, design your own learning environment. Everything you saw there is configurable. It's based on an API. The stuff on top is written in simple JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. You could completely rewrite the interface to Grasshopper if you wanted, and, and it would work. So, and then so, you know, I can swap panels and panes. I can make sub panes, big panes, whatever. I can change the text, the background color, all kinds of stuff. I can add relevant activities. I have my own social network in my learning application, which doesn't go away at the end of the course. Um, I have my own design preferences, and because I'm connected to Ed Radio, I even have my own personal soundtrack. I'm not locked in a box. I hate boxes. My courses come from multiple sources, different institutions, on different platforms. I'm sorry, Moodle, but... <laughs> There are sometimes other platforms. They're not as good as you. They're not as open as you, but you know the world doesn't all use one platform. My courses come from multiple perspectives. In an ideal world, if I can plug in a translation module in multiple languages, they come from, most importantly, many communities. They're diverse. I use multiple learning technologies. Uh, I don't have the slides, but because it's API based, Grasshopper plugs into, well, you can create a sidebar. I wrote a, a Firefox plugin, so it can be a sidebar in Firefox or in, or in Vivaldi. Um, or I, I mocked it up. I didn't actually write the plugin. But imagine you're working in Microsoft Word, and one of your sidebars is your Grasshopper sidebar resources, courses, feeds, whatever drag and drop into your Word document, automatically create the reference. Not done yet, but I have the mock-up. Uh, you know, I, I see this connecting to virtual reality, of course, and we've talked about that already in this conference, etc. Um, and future tech, because it's written to be open and distributed, if this great new application comes along, I just write an adapter and it becomes part of Grasshopper. Or somebody, because it's all open source, somebody writes an adapter and it's all in Grasshopper. Preferably somebody who's good <laughs> at writing adapters. Um, my resources are mine. Think about that. Right? When you finish your course, all the stuff that you did in the course pretty much disappears in most cases. Right. My stuff sits wherever I want it to sit, on my own computer, or I can store it on YouTube, Flickr, cloud storage services, whatever. And it's available, searchable, usable long after my affiliation with the course or the institution has finished. My educational institution could go out of business. The learning platform could go out of business. I'd still have my stuff. I can learn openly. Really, really important. I access open educational resources. Why? Because I'm cheap. Uh, but also because there's a rich, rich range of resources, millions of open educational resources available for me to select from. Typically, I access like one or two in a course. That's crazy. Uh, I exchange them with my friends. It's a way of conversing and talking with my friends. My resources, the ones I create, the ones I access, are available to anyone that I want. I, I like to share them with the world, personally. And most importantly, it's my choice. My learning achievements are visible to whoever I choose. And those achievements I choose to be visible are visible. I can share them or not. And this system creates a machine-readable learning record that is created automatically. So if I apply for a job, say, 
I might write, because I'm attentive when I apply for a job, so I'll write a, a letter of introduction showing I've actually read their website and Wikipedia page. But then I hit a button, and with my application comes my information, my portfolio, my credentials, my badges in a format their system can use. So they can do their screening automatically because I'm so great, my stuff rises to the top. My learning community follows me, not the school. My learning community is personal to me. And it's even a little bit different. You know, if I'm working on a different course or a different project or whatever, my learning community shapes. It's not based on buddies or followers or you know, like social friends, like, a back, like I'm back in high school. And you, Will you be my friend? Yes or no? Right, that's silliness. Right? My learning community is my real community, the people I talk to, that I interact with, that I read, that I forward, that I post about. My learning community eventually becomes my professional community. I am connected. I'm not alone. This isn't atomism. This isn't you learn all by yourself. Right? I'm following other people as they do the same thing. I join cohorts, I leave cohorts, whatever. There's still learning systems, learning management systems out there. There's still discussion boards out there. Right? There are still courses to help me, teachers to guide me. And if I want, I can have a personal one on one conversation via Big Blue Button or some other conversation application. My learning grows, evolves from day to day. It's not based on static content. As the world changes, my learning resources changes as my needs changes. Again, to do it any other way would be craziness. Why do you create a course now that you expect to be relevant six months from now? I can see, because I've got diverse perspectives, patterns and trends as they develop in my field and around the world. And most importantly, I'm part of the community. From day one of my learning, I'm plugged in to the community for that profession. Very important. I can track and understand my own progress, both inside my courses and in the work I do in the community, because my personal learning environment is connected to all of that. My AI and analytics, as I mentioned, are mine. I can see these patterns and trends. And I can get that information from different platforms. That's why personal learning. This is my web page. You can see the output from my Grasshopper application and my own personal learning on it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, and now, as, as promised, uh, we have a, a panel uh, of reactors. And I'll introduce them. Paul and um, they can come up here and, and after that as time permits we can have some uh, invite some questions uh, and answers uh, so I will uh, start off with um, Cindy Plunkett who is um, manager of e-learning and educational technologies at Baycrest Health Science and the Center for Aging and Brain Health and Innovation she's also the executive director of finance for the EACH conference and a professor in the graduate studies programs for family and community medicine at the University of Toronto and the education faculty at the University of Ontario Institution, Institute of Technology. So uh, thank you, Cindy. And um, uh, I'll also introduce uh, David LeBlanc, who's uh, a teacher in uh, Burnaby, British Columbia, and uh, in, for one of the district's alternate programs. He works independently as an e-consultant in instructional design and collaborative learning solutions. He's been using Moodle since 2003 and administers several Moodle supported sites. Uh, he offer, offers opportunities for fellow educators to develop and deliver online courses there. Um, and uh, so thank you, David. Uh, and then uh, lastly, uh, Peter Rowley, who is uh, Director of Applications and Integration uh, for uh, UIT here at, uh, at York. And he uh, among those, of course, is uh, the responsibility for the York Central um, Moodle uh, installation, and he's uh, seeing that those applications work smoothly together for and for providing consulting and strategic advice to members of the York community. Uh, his background is in usability and computer science at Waterloo and University of Toronto, and was technical lead for the groundbreaking computer-supported intentional learning environments project at Boise from 1986 to 1996. Um, so 
I'll uh, start with the uh, Cindy. Just pull it closer. Okay. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much, Stephen. I had a little chuckle when you were um, showing your slide around personal learning versus personalized learning. Um, I'm just finishing up my coursework for my PhD and one of my signature assignments, uh, I asked if I could use a project that I was developing at our hospital. So um, the learning that I um, help facilitate and create is all healthcare based learning. And I had created an environment uh, that was a series of simulations that nurses could do or not do, they could pick the simulations that they chose to do because they wanted more practice in that particular area. And there were a series of discussion boards um, set up within that environment so that they could converse and create communities of practice that merge different nursing specializations. Um, and at the end of that particular environment, what they could do is for the different simulations, um, they could submit care plans uh, which would then be reviewed by a facilitator that would simply give feedback. And um, so the first thing my PhD advisor said was, but how are you going to grade that? <laughs> and I said, that's not the point. <laughs> the point of the activity was around each of those nurses being able to engage and create communities of practice together um, and merge their different perspective, whether it's a first year nurse on the floor versus a 10 year experienced nurse, a 25 years experienced nurse. Um, and you know, nurses talking about pain, we have nurses from ob dealing with mothers and babies, nurses in palliative care, nurses in surgical care that all have very different perspectives on the same topic. The point of that environment was around them each bringing something different around their personal professional practice and enhancing their personal professional practice. Um, so I really, really liked what you were saying there. Unfortunately, in healthcare, we kind of have to walk a fine line, which becomes difficult. We get mired in the fact that we have a lot of legislated training we have to deliver that is all content, 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 test to make sure you cover yourself as an organization to say they have that competency. Um, but I think we're trying to push that envelope more because learners now are asking for it. They want more personalized approach. Um, healthcare are saying one pain course does not meet all needs. If I'm an occupational therapist, a physiotherapist, um, a nurse, I have different learning needs than the other people. And depending on my area of specialization, I have different learning needs. And depending on the number of years I have in practice, I have different learning needs. So you need to design um, better environments. Um, and I'm avoiding the word course because it's really more creating an environment than just content that you're plugging into the course. Creating better environments where the, what you're providing actually meets my learning needs. I'm a regulated, licensed professional. Um, I think I can help decide what my needs are. I don't know if I think I break one. <laughs> David? I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about my environment because that's how it affects my students. They were using this like this. I see that's very good. Um, an agent, agent for change. So, so students could use this, they can develop a um, um, portfolio, basically it would support a portfolio and a direction uh, for them. But the students that come to me, they, um, it's a program that's in the Adult Learning Center in our district. And it's students that are age 17 to 19 that have dropped out or failed. And we're trying to bring them back and get them graduated <coughs> and on a, a path. And I can see that tool really supporting it. But I'm, I can think about the students that I teach and, and, and advise, and uh, for them, what they lack is the motivation to get that done, and they don't recognize their own strengths and, and, and what to look for. So you can see that really supporting it, but it's getting them to use it, first of all, but it's, it has to become part of the culture where it's uh, implemented over time, and, and they have to see the importance of doing that. Because these students, what they need, they meet that with big, 
who at the end get them going and, and motivated them on their way. Um, they have to see their as they have to see their own strengths, their value uh, values, their uh, what they can give back to society, and how they can contribute and how they can connect. And I can see that helping, but it's getting them to uh, use it and, and um, want to use it. Because right now, I mean, you give them something that's um, productive and and engaging, um, they'll, they'll like it, but they'd rather play a video game or they would rather get away from it. So how do you, um, as educators, we can give them these tools, but how do you get them um, connected? And how do you, like, networks, a good way to connect, but um, connected to the things that they don't have the discipline. And if they lack the discipline to get a job done, for instance, um, you've got to, uh, that's through conversation. You have to have a conversation with these students. And, uh, and show them ways that they can connect and contribute because we all can contribute and the other thing is you want them to recognize that um, their voice isn't the only voice that they have to listen and we have to do that at every level right that we have to uh, you can broadcast and you can talk about your strengths and and uh, what you like and what you do but you have to listen to others if you hope to learn and hope to um, um, participate in society you can't participate if you just focus solely on your strengths and your experiences. You have to be open to listening to everybody. And I, I think there's a bit of a danger with that tool of um, using it improperly. But I can see that as a real contribution. A real contribution if you learn how to integrate it. And um, if it sparks action, great. But with my students, it, it would be a struggle to get them to activate their strengths and, and recognize their strengths and, and actually use it. Next David, up uh, here. Hi, I'm Stuart and Emily. Um, before, the, uh, before the talk started, I was talking to Cindy a little bit about the, um, our roles as reactors and um, thought, oh, well, you know, maybe it's like improv. Um, <laughs> And I thought, oh no, but he wrote some stuff, we read that, and then we were done. But of course, what we talked about was really nothing about what you wrote in your blog uh, associated with the session. So this will be like improv. Um, and so some things may go well, and some things may not go so, so well. Um, in terms of reactions, I, I, I did have a few things during the, the course of your talk. Firstly, they, particularly in the higher ed context, what you're talking about, the notion of groups versus networks. If you look at the professoriate, and that's a classic network. And the, the irony, perhaps, is that the, 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 the model, at least the stereotypical model, of classroom <coughs> is, in fact, that group thing in direct contrast to what the way the professoriate works. And you look at all of the offices that the professors have, and each of them is a, is a representation of sort of what you've got there in terms of your virtual. Um, personal learning environment. Each office has its own way of organizing information and extends, of course, into their laptops and desktops. And that builds on a strong tradition that goes back to the, the, the early hypertext work in the World Wide Web. If you read some of the early uh, Tim Berner and Lee stuff, it's very much about expression and um, connecting you know, with the basic hypertext things. And so I think you, if, if you Maybe to talk a bit about how you are drawing on that tradition that after we uh, finish the, uh, the reaction, that would be interesting. Um, in terms of how that's going and whether the, the university has a way of keeping that evolution going, um, there certainly um, are opportunities. And I think because students going to the university now have grown up with this very connected social media kind of environment. And you can argue about whether that's working well or not, but at the very least, the notion of connections, you know, with hashtags, with links, and, and so on, that's becoming something that they're just living in. And so maybe that will set a stage for the more advanced use of that sort of thing, uh, promoted by things like what you're talking about. In, in terms of the, the, um, the specifics about networks and, and students, particularly in, in, in K-12, building on each other's work. There's an interesting um, environment around uh, programming language called Scratch um, that is uh, not just a programming language that kids use to, to make games and other things, but 
released a website of massive amounts of sharing. Um, and uh, there's just a recent book come out um, by the guy who wrote Scratch, I think Scratch's name. Um, and he, it, the book is called Lifelong Kindergarten, which I think would fit in with your philosophy. And, and um, there's a couple of messages in the book. One is that Mitch Resnick thinks that Mitch Resnick is so great. Um, <laughs> the other is that um, he has a learning philosophy of the three P's that, that I think would also fit with what you're saying. Um, projects, you know, as opposed to courses. Uh, peers, as opposed to you know, uh, stages. Um, passion, as opposed to curriculum. And um, finally, flame, as opposed to direction. So those four keys, I think he takes into that that notion of, of working with Scratch and getting kids to uh, to um, uh, just explore with each other. And so if, if people want to uh, go further down the roads, um, that's certainly a good book to uh, to look at. And and in terms of uh, sort of continuing that tradition on revolving, I will um, end with one thing and maybe you can react back. Um, one of the, the, uh, the, the sort of truisms about AI work in the, in the 90s was that if you looked at an AI thesis back then, you could kind of figure out how the brain of the person who wrote the thesis works. And so to the extent that you have a certain personal learning environment, that's probably a lot about how your whole brain works. Um, and the challenge may be to create something that would work for two people or three people that would have some concepts that they would resonate between, between all of those people in a fairly unique way. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. Well, we do have a few minutes um, still, so uh, I don't know if you would like to, to say anything in, in, in response to any of those comments. Yeah, sure. Um, so first of all, thank you for the comments about the medical learning. I actually taught nurses for a while, so a lot of what you said resonated. I taught them logic, <laughs> uh, which was an interesting exercise. But, um, and then the question always came up, why am I learning logic? I'm a nurse. But of course, you know, there are lots, lots of reasons to learn logic in nursing. Um, I, the, you talked about the experience of your students, and you know, we talked about motivation, especially. Uh, my, my students, would be different from your students, right? Your students are there as part of their pursuit of a degree, and in that, they have to take your course. Right? Uh, they're in this traditional content-based, directive-based kind of learning. So I find it not surprising that they're not that motivated. Um, I also think that it's simply not true, empirically not true, that they would just rather be playing video games. If we look at the internet as a whole, right, um, the internet is mostly built by people not playing video games. Um, and indeed, even the people who play video games, and I count myself among that group, you find that at a certain point, they want to be creating those games. They want to take charge of this environment. They think they can do a better job than EA. And frankly, anyone can do a better job than EA. So <laughs> they have a point. Um, you know, and I, I look at, uh, you know, and I, I look at, you know, the mod packs for civilization, for example. Um, I look at cities, skylines, and the mod pack for that, and the incredible cities that are being built. I have a game that I play called No Man's Sky, and I watch videos and look at communities and all that based on that game. It's not true, what you say. Uh, you can see people making things, designing things, singing songs, billions of examples of that. If the people in your course would rather just play video games, my argument is the problem is the course, not the people. Um, so you had a bunch of interesting comments on that. I forgot some of them, but, but uh, 
some of them resonate. The, the one right at the end where you said, well, you know, because you're, you're very concerned about um, individualism and, and people using this to promote themselves. And of course, the question of whether they will use it at all. And this is a model, right? I'm a crappy software designer. I should not be trusted with code. Uh, um, but the, the concept here, right, of having an environment a person can use, ultimately, I would imagine there will be various kinds of environments, hopefully allowing this interlinkage, although in our world, we probably have the Apple universe, which is for rich people, and the other universe, which is for everyone else. Uh, I'm a cynic sometimes. Um, but the thing is, the world would not consist solely of the personal learning environment. Okay, this is this is the message that I this is this and I wish it was in that demo, but I mean half an hour or so. Uh, you use that to connect to places where there are other people. Right, you use it to connect to discussion areas to virtual environments, to the old style MUDs if you want. I, I grew up with MUDs and, and communities and uh, collective programming enterprises, building guilds and things like that, right? And MUDs, the world of MUDs, you know, they're a centralized thing, but people would eventually get their own MUD client, which would automate various tasks and such. And you'd use that to access your mud, right? So you'd hit the get the sword, steal some gold routine to get your, your daily gold and sword. Um, you know, it'd be an interface to program, you'd have your chat channels, etc. All of that is made possible through something like that. So and that's the picture here. That this is the role for things like Moodle and Moodle-like things, right? have a place where people can come in, an open place where people can come in from their various places, their various clients, wherever they are, and share in this online space. And different spaces for different things, right? Again, you're trying to build one application for everything. That is craziness, right? Different spaces for different things. Chat, discussion, engagement, building software, designing sofas, whatever. Um, finally, origins. Um, very influenced by Minsky and Papert. I mentioned them both because I'm also very influenced by connectionism. Uh, the thinking behind this is based on the thinking behind connectionism, not just the artificial neural networks, but also the logic and the mathematics behind that, graph theory, for example, Euler, etc. Also very influenced by the philosophy of science, um, which was one of my specializations back in the 1980s. So I've lived the Kuhn paradigm shift world. Uh, but I've also read and follow people like Larry Laudan, Emir Lakatos, so you know, progress and problems, uh, the idea of a scientific community. Uh, you know, and yeah, you, you see, you know, this is like a scientist's office. This is like, but you know, go go to any small town, go to any garage, you'll see the same thing, right? It's not just professors in their offices. It's also the guy next door with his power tools and his snowmobile. Same thing. My aunt, my father worked with the phone company for the, all, his whole life. He had his office littered with phone equipment. Everybody has this, one way or another. Everybody. So, and that's the influence too. Um, and that's important. So, but also too, right? Philosophy of science, George Lakoff, um, uh, Nelson Goodwin, Goodman, ways of world making, the whole idea that knowledge isn't singular, it isn't unified, it's based on perspectives, points of view, the idea, and here I reference people like Paul Churchill, the idea that knowledge emerges from 
or is emergent from patterns of interactions in an environment, right, where we create new knowledge not by broadcasting and propagating existing means, but by interacting and creating something new that is over and above the content in any particular message. So all that's very important to me as well. Uh, by all means. Go ahead. Go ahead, David. <laughs> I think, you know, it's, it's more about um, a sense of uh, personal discipline, too. Students have to measure to a certain level to be um, to graduate, to um, accomplish goals. Sure. I am actually an academic advisor. I don't actually teach any classes anymore. So it, mine is to get those students reconnected with a plan mm -hmm. to, to graduate. And um, it's it, there's often not that sense of personal um, agency yeah. to get reconnected with um, academia, for instance, to accomplish a certain number of um, courses to complete their graduation. So that's that's the challenge: is getting them to recognize where where they have strengths and to support those strengths, but also to get them motivated and, and look at the possibilities. And if they're just um, they they would rather not do this, it takes discipline. And a lot of them are lacking that discipline. I mean, we all have a love for learning, but students, some students, they, they to accomplish a, a goal or a task in a certain amount of time, they need some discipline. They won't do it without doing the what's required to get through that uh, process of being, in a way to uh, accomplish those tasks. So I don't know. It, it's the that end of it. I don't know how that would support that end of it. And I can see how it would motivate looking at all these things. It would motivate them, but actually doing something they don't really want to do because they have to accomplish the task. I mean, that's the reality of it. You have to get them to engage. I can follow up from the uh, too. The, the, um, the issue around um, creating your own personal learning environments, as the technologies get better and better, and people get to do different kinds of things. When you were looking at building yours, did you find um, Anything around, say, wikis or other <laughs> platforms that, that you consider them as a detriment? Uh, I like wikis. Uh, I think there should be an interface. I actually had a wiki attached to my system. Uh, it was a quickie wiki. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't picky. Uh, so, and um, I mean, the, the, the thing, there's two things with wiki, wikis. The first thing is versioning, right? Really important. I don't have versioning in my system. I'd love to have versioning. Oh, you know, um, just so that you can roll back contents and things like that. And then second, of course, is the collaborative editing. I'm not so much a fan of that. That doesn't mean it shouldn't exist. I think it's a pretty neat enterprise and it's worth trying. But I wouldn't rely on that 100%. And we, we could have a good discussion about Wikipedia, the new role of editors in Wikipedia, power dynamics in Wikipedia, uh, you know, cultural and gender imbalances in the people who are creating Wikipedia. You, you do something like that collaboratively, all kinds of power dynamics come into play. And that creates a whole layer of difficulty uh, in the interface. That doesn't mean we don't want to do it ever. It doesn't mean we can't face and shouldn't face these, these difficulties and challenges head on. But I don't want that to be my only approach to things. So that's basically what I think about wikis. But they're a neat technology. Um, I just wanted to make one point that I think um, when I look at what you created with this site, um, I would argue that in smaller ways, uh, everyone connected to the internet right now is creating their own personal learning. Mm -hmm. um, I look at my eight-year-old daughter who's creating her own YouTube playlist based on what she wants to see and what she wants to learn about uh, because she's very interested in science and technology, so she's following a number of different YouTube channels. Uh, and that's a way of her, at that age, creating a personalized learning. She has her playlist of 
people that she likes to follow and see. Um, Twitter, in a number of ways, would not be as popular as it is if people weren't creating their own communities of practice there and sharing learning. Um, there's lots of other examples of Facebook discussion boards that are not just there for fluffy social purposes, uh, but are there for people to actually have deeper, meaningful um, discussions, and it gives them a platform to do so. I think personal learning is happening all over the place. This gives us a tool that can aggregate um, all of those different sources, but I think it's as um, educators, and I think more as facilitators um, of learning, we need to start considering those other sources as actual viable sources for people to create their personal learning. Yeah. So, uh, so thank you. This has been a very insightful and uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation and discussion. And uh, unfortunately, my job is to keep us on time. So I will have to uh, say, uh, 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 as a token of our appreciation of the steering committee and so forth, thank um, you. please accept that. And thank you for, for that. And also to our uh, reactor panel, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, there's just some housekeeping items. Um, for any uh, new delegates here, uh, the, uh, the, the bathrooms are uh, down this hall. We are about to uh, break, and the break will be in the corridor out there.